Hey, hello and welcome back. And that's right, I want to talk about a brand new QNAP. This is a QNAP that I haven't talked about a vast amount on the channel. It was on a couple of news videos that we did talk about it on the blog. But this is the first time we've properly introduced it here on the YouTube channel. This is a new 6-bay from QNAP. But it's not just a new 6-bay. It's a new 6-bay with kind of a different way of doing things. It's bringing in a lot of familiar elements from the QNAP NAS portfolio. And also introduces some strange market first into the mix that has the potential to really mix up a lot of different NAS releases later this year. Now, why is this such a slightly quirky approach to a NAS? Well, a lot of that is to do with the processor. Before I've even got this out of the box, this is probably the first time I'm gonna talk about the CPU on a NAS before I've so much as touched the lid. It is taking advantage of an eight core processor inside, a graphically enabled, so a graphic embedded processor inside there. I'm gonna get the pronunciation right, that Zhao Yin Zai San, I'm pretty sure I got that utterly wrong. Yes, you did, you plum. Kai Zan or something. Um, that is the KXU658U. This CPU, again, is a 8 core processor. Now, that 8 core processor at 2.5 gigahertz per core, no burst there, is. Um, does arrive with embedded graphics as mentioned and these are c960 graphics the kind of level that we've seen previously on the likes of the intel core for the graphics handling and that is a zhao yin uh, c960 so as much as i'm trying and indeed butchering the pronunciation of lots of those names it should be said that for a six bay to arrive with a cpu of that architecture is pretty darn impressive again not it's very hard to say because it, i want to say it's super duper impressive but at the same time this cpu is rated at around 3000 odd on cpu benchmark which on the face of it sounds pretty good when you look at most of the solarons that we've seen previously knocking around at 2000 to close to 3000 this cpu having 3000 there is pretty darn good but once you look at things like the Intel i3s and the i5s in other six bays, which arguably cost a notable degree more, suddenly that number doesn't look as high as it can be. And I think one of the ways in which this CPU manages to give you a lot of oomph and a lot of abilities on this system, which we will be testing in a software review, Plex performance review, and a virtual machine review very, very shortly, with, these, with this device, I think the slight unknown element of that processor and it's trying to muscle in with the likes of Intel on AMD has resulted on an arguably high spec processor arriving at a more affordable price point. Now I say affordable, this device stocks around for about 1200 quid. That's not cheap. Let's be realistic. That's just tipping over the grand mark at 1200. Now let's put that into relative terms. The 6 bay Celeron NAS, the TS653D, that knocks around for about six to seven hundred quid, probably closer to seven. If you go for the 673A, which is using a Ryzen embedded processor there, that one knocks around for about a grand, about a grand fifty, maybe one thousand one hundred at the very most. And then far into the distance, you've got the likes of the TVS six seven two X and XT, which knock around for about sixteen hundred and eighteen hundred pounds or so, respectively. So this living at twelve hundred pounds is a lot closer to the more affordable end than it is to that far off Intel powered end. But again, an I, it's an eight core processor there. So we're gonna talk more about its specifications, but I've rabbit on about a lot about to do that CPU early doors. Let's get it out of the box. Again, fairly standard packaging there from QNAP for this six space, something we've seen before. Let's get this out of the box. Immediately. We've got our UK mains lead, lovely stuff. Again, internal PSU, 250 watt. Also inside, we have our warranty information there for this device. You can extend the warranty, it should all be available there on screen. First time installation guide and information on that limited warranty there on the front. Inside also, we have screws for installing two and a half inch and three and a half inch drive media. Uh, they are click and load trays, I should add. We've got keys to lock those trays and 
we've got dedicated heat sinks you can apply to the internal M2 NVMe slots that we'll talk about in just a moment. There's also a Cat5 E cable because this device does have um, better than one GBE connections. Again, we'll talk about that in a little while. But for now, let's get it out of the box and get it on the table. Always a fan of these giant bits of foam that QNAP arrived with here. Again, I don't think people take motion damage anywhere near as seriously as they should. And even if you are getting this as a home user, it's still a server, it's still comprised of multiple parts that are susceptible to shock damage. So it's good they at least provision for that still. And not kind of went for the vague cardboard things that I've seen a lot of brands utilize in the last year or two. So, there is the unit. Let's get that closer to camera there. Again, lovely little six bay there. If we get that there on the table, get a closer look at it there. We've got an LCD panel there built into the top to give us real-time information about what the system's doing, individual IPs, activity, temperatures, and more. And the design is one that we've seen many, many times. There's other six bays from QNAP, and they're all kind of utilizing the same very similar chassis here. And we will be taking a little look about the active cooling inside, because this device has really got it going on in terms of cooling there. Now, I've mentioned that CPU, of course, a great deal, the 8-core processor there, but I didn't mention memory. The device arrives with 8 gig of DDR4 memory, 2,400 megahertz memory, non-ECC, that can be upgraded up to a total of 64 gigabytes of memory across two slots. That's a couple of 32s in there. And along with that, there is those NVMe slots. It's got two NVMe SSD slots inside that can be used for caching or they can be utilized for raw storage. Now, it's worth highlighting, due to the CPU lanes on this particular processor getting pretty much consumed by the whole device, those PCIe M2 MD NVMe slots are three times one generation. Now, that is very important. Uh, PCIe M2 three times one slots will allow 1,000 megabytes throughput each. So if you start installing particularly aggressive NVMEs inside, you're going to be capped to 1,000 megs. Remember that. So you don't need to go nuts. Go for something PCIe Gen 3 times 4 perhaps, and even then you won't need to break the bank on those NVMEs inside. It's still good to have them, whether you're going to utilize them for raw storage, if you're going to use tiered storage, that's if you take advantage of QTS, or you use them for caching within the system. It's good to have them, but just bear in mind it's not going to give you the promised three to 4,000 megabytes per second that dedicated devices and PC and consoles and stuff like that that have got M2 NVMe slots on them that have used to utilize the full bandwidth. Where has that CPU PCIe lane bandwidth gone? Well, it's gone to pretty much everything else on this device. If we start small, we can see here with those uh, hard drive bays there, click and load tray. So again, screw holes at the bottom for two and a half inch SSD media. But again, these clips come off very, very easily. You can slot them on nice and straightforwardly. If we look at the sides of the device, we've got lots of active cooling, uh, sorry, passive cooling there, but with fans inside that we will look at in just a moment when we get this device out of the casing. Very interesting, very intriguing there inside. There's also additional cooling at the base for each of those storage bays. It's a metal chassis, so bear in mind, it's not going to be the quietest when this thing's running on all cylinders. And at the front of the device there, as you can see, we've got that red USB port. That's a USB copy button there. And that USB copy button allows you to connect an external drive at USB 3.2 Gen 2. That's right, 10 gigabit per second transmission and back up the content to the NAS at the single touch of a button there. I'm always going to be a fan of USB copy buttons. And this device is no exception. And I love that QNAP is embracing USB 3.2 Gen 2 because data's getting bigger, those backups are taking longer, and USB backups is just another good tier to have in your backup strategy. If we turn this device around, we can have a little look at those connections. Now, there is a lot to be getting on with here, so let's go through them. Now, on the top of the device right here, we can already see two PCIe upgrade slots. That's right, you can upgrade this with two PCIe Gen 3 times 4 cards. That means 4,000 megabytes per second potential throughput per card, which means a couple of dual port 10 GBE cards, perhaps a combination SSD cache 
and 10 GBE card, part of the QM2 series. There's a lot of options open to you there. Wi-Fi 6, internal upgrade performance internally, and more. It's also worth highlighting, I should have touched on it sooner, that with those MT M2 slots in the newer version of QTS, QTS 5, you're going to be able to take advantage of those Google M2 Coral uh, uh, little modules there that can vastly improve AI-powered operations inside the device, a video that we will be testing once that software comes out of beta and into full. On the base of the device there, we've got two Ethernet ports there on the base, and those Ethernet ports, I should add, are 2.5 GBE each, and they can be link aggregated. So again, not your 109 megabytes per second. These are two ports that each can put out around 265, 267 megabytes per second easily, and you can combine them via link aggregation or kind of pair them off with each other on load balancing to vastly improve the connected device and your local area network and all your other devices able to saturate their connections a lot more successfully. Also on the rear, you've got more USB ports there. You've got two standard USB 3.2 Gem 1 ports there at 5 gigabytes per second, and of uh, gigabits per second, sorry, and another red USB 3.2 Gen 2 port there for more fast enhanced storage. What's really interesting, thanks to this device being embedded graphics, we have an HDMI out. This device supports KVM, keyboard, video, mouse, and other HDMI out operations, be it for virtual machine use, for surveillance, for entertainment, and more. So, which means all of those USB ports can also be used for peripherals, your keyboard, your mouse, your more. There are lots of things you can do. You can even assign those USBs to a virtual machine from within the device or multiple virtual machines. And with this being an eight core NAS, it's gonna be very intriguing to see how this performs in virtual machines in a later test video, which I'm genuinely looking forward to filming, but I'm doing the Plex one first because everybody loves Plex. Now, that's pretty much all the connections there, but let's face it, there's a lot of cooling going on here. We've talked about the vents on the side of this device. We've talked about lots of airflow through the front there for all of those six bays and lovely surrounding aluminium environment that doesn't have cables knocking around. But look at all of that active cooling there. Let's grab a screwdriver, get the lid off this device and see just how this system helps and assists that airflow throughout the entire chassis. For those of you that were worried, I found my favorite screwdriver. Call off the dogs are absolutely fine. Now, we can get that lid off of that chassis. Sorry, that was quite close to the mic there. And we can have a look about how things are going inside this device. Before we go any further, we can have a look at this side here. We've got that big internal PSU there, very easy to replace. And I know it's a horrible thing to highlight, and I don't want you to think I'm highlighting the PSU because it will definitely break. But any server, this doesn't just apply to QNAP. This is all brands, all of your devices. One of the earliest things that can break before anything else is the power supply unit. It's the thing that's working the hardest and the most constant in any device. So it's always good to know how easy it is to replace the PSU. Because although you can change it on an RMA, you're gonna to have to ship it away and ship it back. Sometimes it's just easier to get a new PSU from the brand and do it yourself. As long as they're prepared to honor the warranty, do it that way. Or get a NAS that's got an external PSU like some of the ones we've talked about in the past. We go to the other side of this device, we have one enormous heat sink. Look at that thing. That's a monster. Let's bring it closer to the camera and there's even a piece of Perspex there to control the airflow through the device. I know the lights are having a field day with that. It's actually removed the cavity in the NAS there in order to assist the airflow onto that giant heatsink for that Zhao Xin or Zhao Yin. I'm so sorry about the pronunciation. Whatever, Nobby. What did I pronounce it wrong? Guys, um, of that CPU there. We've also got there the memory slots there, those DDR4s that we talked about earlier, two slots, and it's arriving with one stick of eight gig. Um, I should have mentioned earlier on, this device also supports ZFS. It isn't just EXT stuff. So again, you've got ZFS there with QUTS. And again, that is with your fast RAID builds, your completely removing of the volume layer for much faster storage access, RAID resilvering, RAID resync, just general higher performance overall, along with the benefits of data deduplication in line and inline compression as well. But bear in mind, you will need at least 16 gig of memory to take advantage of inline data deduplication. Now, on the other side, we have got those two PCIe slots that we mentioned earlier on. And if you have a look down, we've got this unusual cavity thing here, which again is assisting the airflow there quite substantially, that little triangle there, drawing the air from one of those fans. In particular, 
to that big old heat sink there. That is one giant monster heat sink. And if you look along the bottom there, just there, you can make out the two M2 NVMe slots there at the base. So this is a system that's clearly hugely prioritizing cooling, which does make me wonder just how much heat that CPU is going to generate when in operation. I'm really looking forward to seeing how it performs in some of our tests with virtual machines, and of course when we look at Plex Media Server. But again, that is a, the, probably the most cooling I've ever seen on a six bay NAS. And a six bay is hardly the most aggressive system, which makes me wonder why all the cooling? How hot does this CPU run? Um, but it has to be said that when we're talking about QNAP, we're of course going to talk about QTS, their operating system there for NAS. It's good. There are loads and loads and loads and loads of applications on there with regards to home users, business users, whether you're going to be running your own CMS, whether you're going to be a home user looking at multimedia and photos and videos and more, whether you're going to be taking advantage of surveillance with QVR Pro on this device with eight camera licenses. It's going to be interesting to see if this supports Elite or Pro as well, because it's going to be very strange to see where they land on that CPU. It is a 64-bit x86 processor. It's rated as such, and it is embedded with graphics there. But I'm going to be very intrigued to see how this CPU stacks against that of that AMD uh, Ryzen embedded, the V1500B that we've seen in the um, 673A and even the i3 in that six bay there because um, in the 672X. Because this is a complete unknown to me, this CPU, and I'll be interested to see not only how well it performs, but how well it supports the entire gamut of QNAP's own QTS applications. And with QTS 5.0 beta just on the horizon, we're really interested to see if this is the start of a new range from the brand or something a tad experimental. For me personally, as it stands, I cannot fault this device on its construction. I can't fault the device's cooling, although I query its necessity, and I can't question the sheer number of upgradable ports, the number of upgraded scaled ethernet connections, the M2 SSD slots, the HDMI out, KVM support, the fact it's got USB 3.2 Gen 2, in a six bay for a grand or so. Again, if you shop around, I saw it 1200 on Amazon at the time of recording. I do think this is a device that has the potential to make or break an entire series that follows it. And I'm really interested to see what this CPU can do. If you have enjoyed this review, this hardware review, let's be honest, um, then do let me know in the comments and click like if you did and subscribe to learn more as we go into more depth about what this device can do and find out if this new CPU is the start of something big. Thank you so much for watching. Take advantage of the free advice section over on NAS Compares. It's right down there. It's genuinely free. It's manned by me and Eddie the web guy. We answer your queries very easily, not bots. We don't do anything with your email. If you want to give us a donate, that'd be great, but you don't have to. Other than that, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.